Hey there, you're listening to Making Spaces, the podcast about community, culture, and making new connections, hosted by my good Judy, my friend and yours, Sarah Heath. On this podcast, we're having conversations about design, literally making spaces, and how some of the most inclusive spaces aren't always the most inviting. And we're talking about what it means to make space for one another. With the world the way it is right now, we need to find ways to have conversations across lines of radical difference. So join Sarah each week as she tackles the intersection of design and practical spirituality with conversations with some of the most fabulous guests you're ever going to meet. Some will talk about actual design. Some of us will talk about relational design. But no matter what, it's an incredible time. So grab yourself a cup of whatever you like, and welcome to Making Spaces with Sarah Heath. One of the challenges we've had here is, you know, we have a, a lot of retirees in this community. Mm. And, uh, you know, so they're going to be, you know, significantly older than I am. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, traditionally, the craft beer market is a much younger crowd. And we were trying to figure out, well, how do we hold those in tension? How do we create a comfortable space? that's like cool and dynamic enough, uh, but also familiar and comforting enough. And so that was where this sort of balance of juxtaposing forces and colors and elements and everything uh, came into play to try and strike that balance. And so far, just based on the demographics of people who have come in and watching them co-mingle and get to know each other and sit with each other and things, it's, you know, it, it's been very, very fulfilling, very gratifying to see that vision play out in ways that I had hoped it would. What do jazz, life on the autism spectrum, craft beer, and an old auto shop in Texas have to do with making space? Everything, friends. Everything. This week, I get to share my conversation with my friend Christian Pyatt. Christian has done everything from planting a church with his wife, and he hosted a really well-known podcast. But now he continues to be a podcast editor and write books, but his passion project something that I think he really has been focusing on in such a beautiful way, is that he is the owner, designer, and founder of Brew Drinkery in Granbury, Texas. This is a craft beer and community venue. It was recently featured on NPR. I was really inspired by this conversation to think about how we curate space in a way that both reflects our own passions, but like good jazz leaves room for improv when we encounter the needs of others. Stick around for a weekly takeaway and the inspiring quote. I always start with asking um, what someone's favorite place is. So I'll get started with that. And then um, we will just kind of have a fun conversation about the spaces and places that you're making and um, the spaces and places you made before. So Christian, what is your favorite place to be? And it can be anywhere. And I have to always disclaimer this because so many people say favorite is a hard word for them. So what is it? It doesn't have to be your favorite, but what is a place that you like and, and why do you like it? Um... Well, as far as like a, 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 an event kind of occurrence place to be, anywhere there's live jazz, um, ah. huge fan. Uh, it just, I can't not smile when I'm sitting and listening to live jazz. Um, I love that. Yeah. Um, as far as a particular location, um, I went... Uh, a few years back to uh, Rome on a short trip uh, with some other media folks and uh, and we went to a cafe downtown in Rome and it was just about the best place. I've, I'm sure I've romanticized it in my head at this point, but I don't care. It's kind of mm-hmm. my happy place that I go to uh, in my mind uh, when I need a little mental retreat. I love that. It's just, well, we all have to have like the romanticized uh, place in Europe that we want to go, right? Of course. Even if we've never been, you know, we can imagine it or we've read about it or seen pictures and we idealize it. And uh, then we just kind of escape there when we need to. Now, what was it about that space that you liked so much or that you remember, even if you're making it up, what, what is it? How do you feel when you're there? What is it about it? It was uh, a juxtaposition of the ancient and the modern uh, in ways that were, you know, just so in, in, intriguing because there was this 
uh, permanence uh, about the ancient structures around us. You can see the Colosseum there, and and uh, and and, uh, and then people are walking by with their cell phones and driving by in their cars, and and it was just this really amazing thing to see, like in trying to imagine, like the people who built that had they you know been able to see into the future and. Uh, how now it's more of a curiosity, this thing that they built, you know. Um, but it's it's amazing, like this sense of sort of suspend being suspended in time. And and one of the reasons that it, it made me I, I love that spot so much was that uh I was there with Amy and we were in this cafe on the pat on the plaza, um, and uh we pointed out a building that seemed a lot more French. Uh, in style, and the the waiter was like, "Oh yeah, that it's so new and garish," and, <laughs> and we're like, "New? Like when was it built?" He's like, "Oh, like seventeen hundred and, uh, and we're like, "Wow, it's older than our country," and you know, and to them, that's that's modern and garish, and it's it's kind of what a lot of the structures in Vegas are built to look like. Um, right. The ones that are supposed to look old. <laughs> old. Yeah, exactly. And he's looking at this and it's like, you know, so vulgar and modern. And it, it just was so funny. And it, it made me realize like he was seeing everything so differently than we were and people who were there before. It just, I don't know. I just felt like caught in this moment of kind of timelessness, which was really kind of uh, unique, especially in this, you know, reality that we're in now where, uh, although at the moment it's a little different, but we're usually so hard pressed to move forward. I just kind of felt suspended for a moment, and and that was a, a really cool, uh, romantic kind of ex- experience, I guess. Do you think that's why you like jazz? Because for me, jazz is that like it's both modern and the, but it's also a nod to the past. Yeah. And uh, usually when I'm listening to jazz, I like I want to listen to it on a record or. I want to listen to it when I'm visiting my parents in Mississippi live. There's just something about going to a jazz bar and hearing it in that setting. But it is sort of this nod to what is older, not as old as the things you're talking about, but there is this sort of um, permanence to it. Like It's like this has been done before in like a really, um, I don't know, kind of a comforting way. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, you know, there's it's a ongoing conversation in music mm. uh, that's been happening for decades. Um, and while it's based in this, I mean, it, it goes all the way back to, you know, indigenous African music. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that was one of my favorite classes I took in uh, college was uh, introduction to jazz and American popular music. And it went all the way back, you know, to where it all came from uh, originally, uh, like pre-madrigals and, and all the way back, as far back as they could trace. And how this stuff is steeped in a, in a musical conversation that, that humanity has been having, you know, since we learned to express ourselves and want to connect with each other through that expression. But um, it's also so utterly in the moment. I think that's one reason that I love jazz more than anything else. Oh, it's utterly in the moment. Wow. Yeah. It's spontaneous. It's so spontaneous. Um, and yeah, there are structures around it and there are rules around it. But part of the fun is breaking those rules and, uh, and, and you know, having someone else notice when and how you're breaking those rules and following you down that rabbit hole and, and just seeing where you end up. And sometimes it's a train wreck. And, and that's, what, <laughs> that's kind of fun, too. Like when that's, what, that's kind of fun, too. Like when, you know, you, you get how bad that was, but, uh, even then, you know, just to, to find out, to, to explore together, to see where it goes without any concern for the destination so much as just like how we get there. Oh, I love that. It's so, just I, so great. I, it's so funny. I feel like I'm seeing inside of even the, the work that you've been doing lately. So mm-hmm. I was so excited to ask you to come, um, onto the show because you're doing a really neat space for gathering and we were talking before about uh, we're still recording in the midst of uh, people sheltering in place and so it's been really frustrating or difficult or 
um, an opportunity, as some would say, uh, for those of us who make spaces for people to gather in, because people can't gather right now. Um, but you are, you've created this bar. Can you tell me, like, give me a little bit about this, because it really does have almost the way you feel about jazz is a similar sort of the way you're using old pieces and new pieces and why you're doing it. But if you could just like give me a little bit about um, Brew. It's called Brew, right? Yeah, Brew Drinkery. Um, and it's it's in uh, Granbury, Texas, um, which is uh, about half an hour southwest of Fort Worth. Um, and it's on the, interestingly enough, the historic downtown square. Mm-hmm. Um, that's limestone and, you know, goes back to the, the wild west days. Um, in fact, I, I have a friend who did the graphic design for it, uh, David, who's from Canada and he saw pictures of the downtown and he says, that's real. Like that's a real thing. People really <laughs> still have that kind of stuff around and it's not just like a facade. I said, no, these are real buildings and we still use them. As a Canadian, I'm also Canadian, and I think <laughs> we have a lot of old things, but not Old West. <laughs> right, and I guess that was it. You know, he's he's used to the French influence or whatever. And uh, Well, depending on what side of the country. If he's from Edmonton or Calgary, is no excuse they have that. Right, right. Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, you know, it's just this frontier kind of square, and it's the old uh, clock tower like you see in uh, Back to the Future in the middle of the town square. And, uh, you know, we have parades and festivals and all kinds of things. It's just a really charming place. Um, and Amy, uh, my wife, uh, who's a pastor, got called here a couple of years ago uh, to be a co-pastor uh, at First Christian Church uh, in, here in Granbury. And I thought, okay, you know, this is a, kind of a cool place, but I have absolutely no idea what Where I'm... were you coming from? Uh, we were coming from, well... Uh, the, the last place we had lived permanently was Portland, Oregon, and she was serving in a downtown church in Portland. That's what I remember. Okay. So you're like, we're going to Texas. Yeah. And like, I grew up in Texas, but not a small town. Like I've always lived in big cities, like on Lakeshore Drive or Pike Street in Seattle or things like that. You know, I've just never been a real rural person, uh, particularly. So this was a big shift. Um, but uh, I had had this sort of romantic affinity, if we go back to that word again, this affinity <laughs> for uh, creating a place. Um, I used to talk, actually, when I was still in college, uh, my mom reminded me uh, that we would sit around and daydream about opening like a coffee shop slash bookstore event space. Yeah, I had the same dream. Okay, yeah. And a lot of us do, you know, at some point And uh, but but so rarely do we get a chance to to realize it, I think. And uh, I I had gotten into you know uh, craft coffee and craft beer in uh, Portland, and because you have to in yeah, order to stay it's there, a requirement it's like or a law. They make yeah. you move, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd really gotten into it. I'd learned how to brew. I'd learned a lot more about coffee. And, uh, you know, community gatherings around those experience, shared experiences are really special. Um, and so I brought that uh, sensibility, those values, I guess, um, mm-hmm. to Granberry. And I got here and I saw um, that there were two things that I noticed. Um, uh, all around the square, there were a lot of like uh, boutiques and uh, knickknack shops and curio shops and things like that and a lot of wineries Mm. Um, but there wasn't a craft beer place anywhere in town Um, and there was no real substantial performance space Um, these there are a lot of places where people would go in and out to go shopping a lot of people come here to sightsee or shop but um, you know what is there to do after say seven o'clock and then the answer is not a whole lot or to gather because shopping is often like a two to three person experience but actually gathering is different right like where do you go and just be there for a while and so um, some of our friends actually showed us this space that they were helping try to uh, lease out for, for uh, their employer. 
And as soon as I walked in the building, I said, yep, I know exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do in here. You sent me a picture of it and I was like, oh my gosh, I was so jealous of you in that moment. It's just got the coolest bones. It does. It used to be an auto uh, garage. And, uh, you know, in fact, there was still the hydraulic lift, the base of the lift and the floor. It's all concrete and cinder block and glass brick. And, and it's just a really cool space. Um, and it was kind of a blank slate. It hadn't been any, it had not been redone uh, in decades. And so it was kind of just waiting to be realized. I thought, while a lot of people looked at it and thought I was kind of crazy, um, I saw the opportunity. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, kind of went from there. I don't want to ramble on, but I don't know. You know, I think it's the eyesight, right. Of a artist or, um, a creative is that you see the thing that isn't seen yet. Um, yeah. you can look at a space that some people, um, sort of have given up on and you see the, the bones of it or, or what it could be. And instead of thinking you have to start all over again, let's tear it down and build something new. You see the the bones on which to build something, um, for gathering people. And I, I love that that was your first experience and you knew that you wanted to have a music space and you knew you wanted to kind of offer beer and coffee, uh, or beer. I don't even know if you guys serve coffee. Oh yeah. All oh, things brew. That's, That's the idea. All things brew. I love it. Uh, and so when you started, you really did sort of take the, the way that it had looked and use that and also, kind of added on on to that um and you know you come from you know your wife is a pastor and uh what area of work were you doing before if you don't mind sharing with people oh <laughs> i had an eccentric uh i have an eccentric resume i know <laughs> um, yeah and uh and so uh, that's always a weird question you know i was uh um i was an author uh yeah. have, have been an author for a long time um, and, uh, and done editing and some ghostwriting for folks, uh, had a podcast for several years myself. Um, and I've done a lot of, uh, audio and podcast production for other, uh, for other, uh, organizations trying to kind of enter the conversational space of, uh, podcasting. Um, and, uh, I did a lot of, before that I did a lot of grant writing, uh, did a lot of work with nonprofits, uh, trying to help them uh, create sustainability um, for their organizations. But uh, but yeah, more recently, mostly writing and and podcasting. So still, which I think is all space. sort of tied in together. And I've never um, noticed how it's all community making. Yeah, um, and somebody else pointed that out, and I thought that was really interesting. It never occurred to me, but. It, it Well, and it, it's interesting also, I should probably mention, uh, both my son and I, who is a musician as well, and, and I'm a musician too, um, we're both uh, on the spectrum. Uh, oh, amazing. Autism spectrum. And so connecting with people is really kind of hard. Um, and so like going into the unfamiliar uh, is really hard and spontaneity and small talk and unpredictability are very uh, difficult but if we can kind of create a, a playground in which people we can invite other people to to come and, and kind of have those conversations where we understand kind of the the context and the rules then it's a lot safe it feels a lot safer um, yeah oh that's such a fascinating piece of it yeah you're kind of making community as someone who is sometimes felt outside of community. Oh, very much. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, you know, like if I go somewhere unfamiliar with uh, Amy, I'm like, do not just wander off. Cause she, I don't know if you <laughs> talk much on the show about the Enneagram, but she's a seven, she's a social butterfly and she loves a party. And so she would just kind of bounce around from group to group and person to person if she had it her way and I get paralyzed. So <laughs> What are you on the Enneagram just for fun? I'd love to know. Yeah, I'm a five. Uh, yep. <laughs> and I also score just about equally as an eight. Uh, so what I have found is when I see injustice or when I get confronted in a way that I think is unfair, that's when my eight comes out. Okay. Otherwise, okay. I'm more analytical and reserved and introspective and more of a deep dive kind of person. 
So yeah, we have talked a little bit about the Enneagram. Just um, a couple of designers that we've had on um, have shared a little bit about being what their numbers on the Enneagram are. Um, not even meaning to. It's sort of like a if you don't know what the Enneagram is, friends, look it up because it, it's not that it's a cult, but people love to talk in numbers, and it is fascinating to me how much it does ring true in. It's not all true, right? But it does give us sort of a a paradigm to sh- like understand someone in a different way. And as you speak about, you know, creating community for folks because you needed there to be a paradigm to understand it. I think that's sort of the helpful way where we can see like, oh, that's what's happening there. Or, oh, that's what's happening there. And I, I really think um, there's a lot more... Um, there's a lot more to it than we have even begun to uncover and understanding, um, giving each other grace and space to be who they are within community. Um, because I think so many of the communities that have been created before are gunning for a certain type of person or um, a, you know, you need to agree to all these things in order to be part of this. And then you come to something like a, a bar and it's kind of the great equalizer. We're going to take a brief break from this conversation to listen to some messages from our sponsors that make this podcast possible. I think a lot of the normative rules of group dynamics are established by those extroverts that are, are prone to go out and just kind of gather people together. And yeah. so as challenging as it is as an introvert, uh, you know, who is largely spent the last decade or more behind my computer to then go out and try and build physical community. Um, I think it's one reason it looks and feels so different to people uh, than they might otherwise be used to in, especially in a place like uh, Granberry. And, and people walk in and they're like, Oh, I love the energy here. It's just so different. And so uh, um, exciting. Uh, it's energizing in a way that they're not used to. Even the photos just make you want to kind of be there and they make you want to stay for a while. Can you share a little bit about the intentional way that you designed the space? Because you were really hands-on in creating this space from the idea of what it could be to like the layout. Um, can you share a little bit about as you were designing it for people to have conversation and community, how did you think through that? Sure. So, uh, yeah, it's a long rectangle. It's about 2,600 square feet. Um, and so in the back, uh, the back half roughly is uh, our performance space. And so we created a stage there. It's got sound and lights. We have a big projection screen that we can use for movies and things like that. Um, and uh, then the, uh, the seating is, is you know, positioned all around that. Um, and that space is darker. Um, and so all of the, the walls and the ceiling and everything are a darker gray, which at first people thought I was crazy. I said, but you've been in a theater, right? Where like Mm. a black box theater, the whole idea is you control the environment by the lighting. And so we put these, uh, adjustable led, uh, strips, uh, behind, uh, drum cymbals on the walls and so we which create- i thought was such a creative thing that like not actual working drum symbols but drum symbols as a artistic element in the building to like sort of already get people's minds around this is a creative space this is we're going to use things in a different way familiar things in a different way i just love that yeah and and so it it, it speaks to the value of of what is important here um, and it's also because there are so many uh, stark, uh, straight lines in this space. I loved it that they're round, and, and there are so many muted industrial kind of colors here, and then you have these brilliant symbols, mm-hmm. um, and the light that's like projecting out from behind them along the walls, uh, and they fade through a cycle of colors. And so every time you look around, the room is different. Um, oh, and, fascinating. And so it's this cyclical kind of uh, rhythm to it. Um, and, uh, and it just is constantly kind of changing, but it's also this juxtaposition of, of soft and hard, um, of warm and 
cold, of old and new. So we have uh, all of the furniture is reconditioned uh, old furniture we found. Uh, either in old semi trailers out this this guy who was a hoarder had just sitting in his <laughs> in semi trailers out and you know that he'd gotten at auction or that we got uh, or that that we got at auction and then refurbished um, and so we would uh, and, and and so we we took these old things and we made them new and uh, we like kept the space them. yeah yeah we we use that to kind of inform the space and then in the front. Um, we took a, uh, a, a drum set and we inverted it and put, uh, we hooked them all together, uh, like a chandelier and then put the led lights inside of that and they project down over the bar and those change colors as well. And so the, the lighting in the front is a drum set and the symbols along the walls. And then the bar is an old, uh, Brunswick, uh, bowling alley lane that we found in one of these semi-trailers and we sanded it down and refinished and epoxied it. Yeah, I love it so much because it, it, it's just the coolest look, a bowling lane as a bar. Yeah, and, and it's still got like the old stamps that said refinished by Brunswick in 1969, November 1969. And uh, I just thought that was so cool, you know. And uh, But then we've got this sort of modern industrial, we have these, uh, and we have these abstract expressionist uh, uh, paintings, these large abstracts, with bold, bright colors on the walls, and, uh, and then the, the bright lights of the, the chandelier, you know, you know the, the drum chandelier. But then we've got like a cut steel sign of the logo on the back wall, uh, and it's backlit with the LED lights as well. So there's this cohesiveness to it, even though there's a juxtaposition of old and new, cold and warm, hard and soft, uh, all kind of coming together. It was very important to me to have the, the sort of stone and metal work and everything, but then to also have natural wood like the, like the bar uh, to have this connection. Uh, yeah, it's sort of a, a holistic. Yeah. Um, instead of, you know, sometimes you go to places that are so stark clean or stark that it feels like um there's a coldness to it but if you're redoing sort of an older um building space there is this kind of neat thing you can do where you bring in the industrial but then you soften it with the textures that you bring in right um and it's so neat how you've created even like little areas for people to to gather it's like the building even suggests it that you know wherever they're standing they're going to get a different view like there, there's something different to look around um it's such a neat use like you said of old and new and it's funny to me how it like echoes even the description of the place that you liked to be from the very start of when we started talking there's this ancient modern thing that's happening and i i think it people are really resonating with that um the idea that we we became for we've been for so long a throwaway culture um, you know, and when you first started the project, I would go places and take pictures of chairs for you. Cause I'm like, look at these chairs. <laughs> um, because people sometimes don't realize the treasures that they have. Um, just, they just need to be given a little love and a little repurpose. And I think it's the same sometimes with people, the, there's like a hiddenness to, uh, who they are that you can bring out in community and, um, and spaces to gather where they can experience other people. Um, so you were open for how long before we hit this pandemic? Oh, man. So we were open uh, just over seven weeks uh, yeah. before uh, the coronavirus outbreak. And we were the first in town to start going on restrictions. So uh, as, a, as a five on the Enneagram, I created a system, of course. Yeah, of course um, you did. Yeah. And uh, it was like a four-stage system, so... Uh, at stage one, um, we went to all uh, disposable drinkware and plateware um, mm -hmm. and using gloves uh, for everything. So instead of glass, um, <clears throat> we used uh, disposable, and, uh, mind you, compostable, but disposable uh, drinkware. Uh, at at uh, stage two, then we closed the back room uh, because that was the biggest gathering space we had. Um, gotcha. And we canceled all our uh, events in the back, the music, 
and the, uh, the, the private reserve defense that people had, you know, booked uh, for the back room. Uh, then at stage three, uh, we did uh, only service out on the patio. You could come in and get something, but then you had to go outside with it, which is allowed here on the square as long as you uh, have a beverage, uh, even an adult beverage, in a, uh, in a plastic or a, or a paper cup. Um, you can walk around the square with it. Um, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. Texas. Yes, uh, which is exactly why, I, one of the reasons I don't serve hard liquor here. There are many reasons, but that's one. Uh, because then, you know, as long as I don't have the hard liquor license, people can walk out uh, with it and stroll around and 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 not worry uh, about getting in trouble. So uh, we would serve outside, uh, and we had a rollout bar that we could take out front and serve people that way. And then the fourth stage was to shut down. And actually, um, we were the first on the square to close down um, and to the point that it made the news. The local paper came out and did an interview with me about it. Uh, <laughs> um, but we felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, uh, my daughter um, has some health challenges and uh, I couldn't, you know, in good conscience, put her at risk. Uh, our people at our church uh, are gen- tend to be older. <laughs> Um, yes. And I felt like I had a responsibility uh, to the. Yeah. Yeah. We closed down fairly early um, because of uh, same thing. We have older folks who are in my community. And um, although there are a lot of younger folks, it just it was sort of like we don't want to do community without you. So therefore, we'll do community online so that we can be together. But we're not going to do it where you can't be involved um, or we're risking you. Um What are the things in seven weeks, what are some of the things that you saw developing? Like, were you starting to get local, like, or or regulars, I should say? Yeah. In fact, there was a guy, we call him Randy the Regular. Um, (laughs) And uh, I've seen him uh, around the square a couple times since, and uh, he'll just be driving by or something. I'll come over to check just to make sure it hasn't been broken into or something. (laughs) Um, And I'll say, I can't wait to come back and uh, and share a beer with you, Uh, you know things like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we started knowing what people liked and based on what they enjoyed the time before, we would make suggestions about what, what new things we had in because we have constantly rotating taps. We have 44 uh, taps. Um, uh, so 44 different beers on tap. At a, oh my gosh, that's incredible. Oh, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, and it's a really visually striking because I, in fact, I was very intent on making sure all there, there are four in the back room on the mobile uh, unit, but then the 40 in the front, I was very intent on making sure we kept them all in a straight line instead of staggering them or pushing them. You are my people. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted that visual effect when people walked in of seeing an entire wall of, of taps. And, um, you know, if you ever come and look, the horizontal lines are a very big deal here. And as you said, it, it keeps your eye moving. Um, and, uh, and, and so I wanted that to be very visually striking. Um, and, and so we're always very excited when people, you know, come back and we get to share something new or we were, um, when we got to share something new with them because the kind of people, it's interesting now, I had never really thought of a corollary between jazz and craft beer, but, you know, there are certain very fundamental rules to making beer. There are a few things that have to be in it. You know, uh, you have to have your, you have to have your grain, you have to have your, uh, yeast and you have to have your hops. Um, and, uh, and then it's really just in different ways that you play with those simple ingredients that you get so many different iterations. And it's very right. similar with jazz, you know, um, And the people who take the care to have craft beer, it's interesting. I have discovered in my life so many of my friends um, either uh, were involved in craft beer or work in craft beer, or they um, are really into craft beer. And I think it's because it's a certain type of person who um, takes the time to learn the notes. Uh, Yeah, same word, notes, right? Um, But learn the things that uh, go into it. that are meticulous, but interested, um, wanting to break the rules, wanting to know the rules. It's a, it's a really interesting, um, correlation between the two. I've never thought of it until I was talking to you. Yeah. I hadn't either. Um, and so it's, again, it's this, 
it's this thing that, um, it, it, you know, and it makes sense to me now, thinking as a spectrum person that I like once I know what the boundaries are, even if, mm -hmm. if I want, you know, if ultimately I transgress those boundaries, um, I at least know where the fence line is, so to speak, with the, within the, the context of this culture, then I can operate more comfortably within it. Um, and I can do anything with this combination of rhythm and melody and harmony or, you know, hops, grains and yeast, um, that I like, um, mm. and it's still got some connective tissue to the core, you know, to the taproot of where all this comes from. Um, and so there's something very comforting about that and also very exhilarating. And when you discover something completely new that you've never tasted or heard or played before. Uh, within that context, thinking, you know, uh, just this infinite number of permutations that you could do. And you could spend many lifetimes just exploring the different combinations and possibilities. Maybe it's the uh, preacher in me, but I hear the object lesson even of community. You have to make a space that people are familiar enough with mm -hmm. that they can let down some guards. Or even if they, maybe they have some guards up because it's familiar but when you bring in familiarity and then reclaim things uh, in a way that makes space for them and who they are, it is that sort of almost that experience of, I've had this before, but never like this. Um, you know, that's interesting uh, way to put it because one of the challenges we've had here is, you know, we have a, a lot of retirees in this community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so they're going to be, you know, significantly older than I am. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, traditionally the craft beer market is a much younger crowd. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how do we hold those in tension? How do we create a comfortable space that's like, you know, cool and dynamic enough, uh, but also familiar and, and comforting enough. And so that was where this sort of balance of uh, juxtaposing forces and, and colors and elements and everything uh, came into into play to try and strike that balance. And so far, uh, just based on the the demographics of people who have come in and and watching them commingle and get to know each other and sit with each other and things, it's uh, you know it, it's been very very fulfilling, very gratifying to see that uh, that vision kind of play out in ways that I had hoped it would. I I think it's. Um absolutely needed in culture. I worry, um, one of the things that I really worry about is the amount of othering uh, that we do because we don't have relationship or proximity to people who are different than us. And yes, um, you might be similar in that you like craft beer, whatever it might be, but there needs to be one thing you're connecting on. Um, but our, our communities aren't integrated age-wise in a way that they used to be. So this, when this town was at its you know, former peak, People were usually around their, you know, nuclear family, but they also had like other people that were sort of different uh, age demographics. Maybe they were involved in a church, whatever it might be. They were knowing they were um, intimately involved in the life and life cycle of people of different ages. Mm -hmm. And I think when we can create spaces where that can happen again, um, it's so important for both demographics. I think some of the things that we're seeing, even as we think about this pandemic, are because people they don't have a name and face necessarily to put with an age group other than some distant relative because we're not as close now um, as we are a very mobile um, community uh, for lots of reasons. And I think the beauty is I imagine, um, and I've always imagined as you were talking about your space, that different age groups could learn to appreciate each other and be in relationship with each other, kind of in, in my mind in the way that like my British relatives have their pub. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their community pub. Very much. The, it's very much modeled on the public house model uh, from Europe. Um, and, and it's interesting because I've seen it butt up against some other um, very American uh, sensibilities of how things should be separated from one another. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, we have a little children's play area. Uh, here and uh, during the day we roll out this little uh, carpet that has like a little town laid out on it and you know you can get little action figures and cars out and you know play make-believe and there are blocks and 
musical instruments and colors and puzzles and things like that to, uh, for, for people to bring their kids in and enjoy time with them. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, we had one woman who came in when we were showing her all this, and she was horrified. <laughs> so you have you have a you have a place for kids in a bar and we're like actually it's a community space that also has drinks but it, what I said to her was I was like you yeah, know the one of the biggest places to go in town is Chili's uh, because you know we're a small town and I love that I love that image <laughs> yeah and I said so do you go to Chili's and and she said yeah of course and and I said uh, you know of course <laughs> and uh, and I said you know would you take kids there and she's like yeah and I said you know they have a full bar there in fact they serve hard liquor there whereas we don't. And, uh, well, it's different. It's a restaurant. And I said, so really what we're getting time. down to is semantics here. We're not getting down to, you know, the fact that there's something inappropriate happening here. It's the intention behind the space and mm-hmm. what your presumptions about the space, how that, what it should be. And if anything, I don't want to be what some people think I should be. While I also want to be, like you said, that, that balance of the familiar and the novel. Um, yeah, I think that's this beautiful opportunity for what you're doing. And I, I just love it. And I cannot, I, it's on my list to come see. I, you know, as I've been realizing my just passion for making community spaces, I just want to go on a tour. If it's in a RV, my dreams are made true. But I just want to go on a tour of people who are making unique spaces for people to gather for whatever it might be. And in a weird way, the gathered body, like having people just together is just to me an opportunity for us to have some of our ideas about well this is this way or those people think that way um and there is this great you know uh equalizer when we're together in a space um and having to put a name and a face to some of the ideas that we've had before so i am grateful to you for making space for people so I want to uh, ask you this question and i ask everyone this question um but i'm excited to hear your answer what is one t- like tangible thing that you think you can do when people are making space for other people? When you are either you can think about designing or making however you want to think of that question, but what is one tangible thing that if people are listening and they want to make a space for people, what's something they can think through? Um, you know, when I think about this place, it's got my DNA all over it. I told I told my uh, my wife um, that this is kind of this space is my heart turned inside out mm. um, in a way. Um, I love that. Yeah, you know, for somebody who struggles to connect with people, sometimes uh, this is a way that I can be very vulnerable with people and welcome them in quite literally um, in a way that's I can tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I couldn't, uh, it wouldn't have worked if it was just me building a clubhouse for myself of all the things that I thought was, were cool. Cause I would have done things a little differently here. I think, um, I had to think about the space and the different needs of the people and the, the experience and the, the concerns, the, the anxieties they might have, like when they come in and see this huge wall of beer and all they've ever had is like nick ultra or coors light you know mm-hmm. how overwhelming that is and how do we respond to that or how do we accommodate that and acknowledge it and help them through that um and what about you know with mobility challenges um uh, you know people with uh, children how do they how do we communicate to them that they are welcome here um uh, you know and, and and just so many things like that so really um we creatives sometimes get so caught up in the process of personal expression mm. that we forget to get our egos out of the way. I think uh, when we're creating space that we're trying to welcome other people into, um, we're not just making a statement when we're creating a space. Um, we are uh, trying to prepare uh, with forethought, uh, compassionate forethought of those who will, enter into that space and to do that well i think we have to get our egos and our and our ourselves uh, out of the way 
Uh, once so did you invite people into the process in, in order to make sure that happened? I absolutely did. Um, I for example, that. people who are a lot shorter than I was, you know. <laughs> uh, or, Which is a lot of people. Yeah. Or I had a guy uh, who's from the real t- uh, real estate office next door come over who's uh, in a wheelchair and mm. just kind of take a tour of the space. Um, my son, who uh, is so um, auditorily acute, you know, to come in and listen to the space, you know, and the volume and the, you know, um, and things like that. And, um, and of course everyone has an opinion. Yeah. (laughs) So if you just kind of set them loose and just see how they respond to the space and see where they gather and, and, uh, I'm always improvising and responding in a way kind of like jazz, you know, as, as I see people come into the space and use it, um, I see where there are bottlenecks and I see where people get confused or seem to be less comfortable or, or how they use things in ways I didn't think of, you know, and then I try to adapt to that, whether it's what I originally had in mind or not, uh, because that's a part of creating a space is allowing your ideas and your efforts to be used in ways that you wouldn't have necessarily intended or used yourself. It's a, it's a letting go. Well, I love that image of because it's your heart turned inside out that now these things are part of your heart. And so allowing yourself to be as affected as you are affecting, um, is a big part of making space for other people. Like you said, you didn't need another clubhouse. You needed a space in place. And I think churches and the communities that I've been, um, giving advice to lately is that's a great um, image for them is like, yeah, this can be your heart, but it, you have to be willing to allow it to be affected by others. Otherwise you're really not ready to make space for people. That's right. Then really what you're trying to build is a clubhouse. (laughs) And we've got enough of those. Those are, there's lots of those because what happens is that those people that um, had affinity and that for that, they stay together and it, and it kind of just, dies out and then it becomes a museum to that time when it was like that. And that's one thing I love about Europe. I mean, going back to all the way to the start of the conversation is um, they have kept the buildings, but they have allowed uh, change within as far as how people are and, you know, what they are and how they're connected to their past, but they're also including their new. So having a children's space in a um, building from the 1700s would not be beside them. You know, that's just part of it. It's you live into these spaces. They're not museums. And I think um, I'm hopeful that we'll see more of those. And even though we are isolated physically from each other right now, I think this is a great time for people to start thinking through what are the spaces that I make for people and how can I, yeah, how can I be affected by the people who I actually want to come into the space? Because it's going to be surprising. They're going to use it in a way you weren't ready for. That's right. And you're going to be changed in the process. And so if you're not ready to be changed, uh, again, you're probably not ready to let go enough to be creating spaces for other people yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us, for walking to your place. I know it's uh, it's got to be a little painful to unlock the doors, even though it's your place. Um just hoping to have people there soon. I know that we are caregiving for other people and hopefully uh, by the time this comes out, people will be able to gather again because we've got a couple episodes first, but I am so grateful for you. Thank you for letting me be part of your journey and sending me photos because it makes my day. Oh, I've loved when you see things that you think uh, connect with it because it's it's been an inspiration to me and to, to see somebody's imagination being captured by the same things uh, that mine is. Uh, makes it that much more enjoyable. So thank you for that. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you will think through what letting go in your own creation of spaces and design might look like. Check out the show's notes for more information on Christian. He really is a talented creative in so many ways, and I'm grateful that I got to take a little look inside this important project of his. This week's inspiring quote is from author Gail Sheehy. Creativity can be described as letting go of certainties. Have a great week, friends. Making Spaces is edited by Stephen Burnett from The Cult Popcast. The introduction music is It Can Be Done by Ari via Epidemic Sound. If you like this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 
and leave us a review. It helps other listeners find us and let us know that we're on the right track. <laughs>